Clement gave on uh, Wednesday, you might have seen this definition of uh, what a persona is. Now, a persona in the design world is a compromise for never meeting real stakeholders, and it's written by gamblers and liars. Now, you'll be pleased to know that uh, this is not the type of persona that I'm going to be talking about today. Instead, the type of persona that I'm going to be talking about today is the one that we find on the LCA website right here. Now, how many people noticed when they registered that there was this new button? Can I get a quick show of hands? OK, quite a few people. Good. Now, the problem that we're trying to solve with Persona is this. We want to solve the password problem on the web, no less than that. So that's what we're trying to solve. And, that's, and especially what we want to, um, to move away from is something like this, something you might you might have seen today, something you might see every day when you use the web, right? The good old username and password form. There are many problems with this. Security is one of them, right? If you've been following the news recently, you will have seen a number of companies apologizing publicly after losing quite a lot of their passwords to hackers. And, you know, you could make fun of any one of them, especially IEEE for uh, not following God, you know, best practices and things like that. But the reality of this is that this stuff is hard. It's easy to screw up. And in fact, having passwords for, for your users is really a liability. If you, if you are going that way, here are the things you have to do, right? You have to hash your passwords using something like bcrypt, scrypt, pbkdf2, one of those complicated things. Then you have to use per user salt values because you can't reuse salt values uh, between users. You have to have a site secret outside of your database if you, so that if your database gets stolen, uh, you know, the, the, the attacker is still missing a piece of information. Then you have to have proper password and lockout policies. To, to deter brute forcing of your uh, passwords. And of course, you, your recovery mechanism has to be just as secure as everything else. Otherwise, it, the rest may not exist. But the real problem with this list is this. These are the 2013 password guidelines. I can guarantee you that in five years, there'll be even more stuff to do, because this is an arms race between you and the attackers that are trying to steal your passwords. Now, of course, let's be honest about the kinds of passwords that your users will choose. This is the top 1,000 passwords, maybe top 500. And this is not the slide title, the big word in the middle. It's the most popular password. It's a little bit depressing. Now, there's another problem. Uh, it's not just all about security. Um, and it has to do with conversion rate. If you look at typical metrics for sites, it's not uncommon to see something like this. Lots of people going to your sign-up page, and a lot less people finishing the sign-up process. Now, there can be a lot of explanations for this. You know your site better than I do. But uh, one thing that you should consider is that there is a cost to picking a new, a new username and a new password, or the same username but a different password, just for your site. And a lot of pe uh, people, a lot of your potential users, will, be, will have to make a decision. Do I want to remember yet another password, or is this site just not worth it? In other words, that gap is costing you real money. Now, there are existing solutions. Not everybody is using usernames and passwords to log into websites. Here's one that I particularly like, client SSL sites, right? This is the same, um, same type of certificate that you use when you want to expose your site over HTTPS. So you go to, to a reputable certificate authority, and uh, you pay a bunch of money for some numbers, and uh, then you put that on your server, and that tells to all the browsers out there that your server is legitimate because you paid money for these numbers. Now, you can get a similar type of certificate to uh, put in your browser, and then your browser will hand that over to the various websites that you visit to identify you uh, at those websites. Now, when that works, it's, be it's beautiful. It's kind of like SSO for the entire web. You just go to the website, your browser does the rest, and you're logged in. So it's brilliant. How many people, out of curiosity, have used this mechanism to log into a website in the last week? <laughs> OK, like, I don't know, like less than 10 people? Last month? Okay, a few more. Last year? Right, still not that many. 
So it's really hard to, uh, to actually implement on a, on, on a web server inside web applications. The, the support inside browsers is not very good. And the mobile story, you know, multiple devices and stuff just isn't very good. So almost nobody uses that. Let's talk about something that a lot of people use. The idea of, of outsourcing your identity to a central authority. Now these are the two most popular ones, Twitter and Facebook. And uh, of course there's the obvious problem of what happens to your users that don't have a Facebook account or don't want one. Or don't want to uh, log in with Facebook on your website because they think that you're going to know everything about their friends if, you, if they do that. Well, that is a problem. Um, but there's another more subtle problem, which is if you are running a business, do you really want to outsource the thing that's perhaps most precious about your business, it's your customer's list, to a third party for-profit company that may change its terms of conditions and exclude some of your users or you know, may just decide that the service isn't worth running anymore. It's a bit of a risk. Um, but more, more than that though, if we're trying to look for a solution for the open web, this is just not it, right? We can't have a, a private uh, company being the gatekeeper of the internet. What about OpenID? The really great thing about OpenID is that they brought back the idea of federation, decentralization, to the identity space. So in the OpenID world, anybody can be uh, an, an OpenID uh, identity provider. You can choose who your identity provider is, and you can change identity providers if you want. And in fact, you can, you can also run your own identity provider uh, if you're technically inclined. Now, there are various problems with OpenID. Um, it hasn't seen the sort of adoption that a lot of us would have liked to see. And uh, it has had sort of usability issues. Having a URL instead of, uh, uh, instead of a username or something like that is, is pretty weird for a lot of people. But the reason why Mozilla couldn't get behind OpenID and, and adopt that as its solution um, is that OpenID has a very serious privacy flaw. And the best way to explain it is to use an analogy. Imagine that when you uh, last checked into a hotel and when they ask you for a piece of ID to make sure that the name matches the one on the reservation, imagine if they took your driver's license and then phoned up the government that issued it by right, asking to, just verifying that it's valid. Well, that would give that particular government department a trail of every hotel you've ever checked into, which is a little bit creepy. Um, but also, it would allow that government, based on other information that they have, such as, I don't know, maybe you have a student loan that you haven't fully, fully repaid yet, it will allow them to say, well, that student loan you haven't fully repaid, now you're traveling to this other country, and, you know, no, we'll just deny you that stay. You should, you should focus on paying your debts, and after you, you're debt free, you can stop going to backpackers. You know, it's a bit of a stretch, but the, 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 the point here is that that's exactly the kind of power that we give to an open ID identity provider. So unless you are running your own identity provider, that really affects you. So storing passwords is hard, it's a big mess, and there are no real suitable alternatives for the open web. And that's why we decided to build Persona. Now Persona, just like open ID, is a decentralized system. Anybody can be uh, their own identity providers. You can change identity providers if you want, etc. So it's, it's also federated. It is uh, privacy sensitive. So we put the browser in the middle of the, of the chain. So the browser is, is your trusted intermediary because uh, the browser already sees every website that you're logging into. So it's not a big deal. And we want this to be really simple. Um, simple both for developers, because if it's not simple for developers to implement, then it's never going to be secure. And we also want to make it simple for users, because if it's not simple for users, then sites are not going to adopt it. So we have a really strong focus on user experience. And uh, finally, of course, like everything else that Mozilla does, this system is fully open source. Now, this is identity in your browser. We want to, to make the login system of authentication be part of a standard, uh, we want this to be a standard part of the, of the web browser, of all web browsers. It's not a Firefox specific thing. It should be baked into the web. 
How does it work? Well, if you only remember one thing from this presentation, it should be this. Persona is based on a concept of a verified email address. Now, I have an email address, here's one of mine, and I have some kind of proof that proves that I own it, and that's all I need to be able to identify myself consistently when I visit websites. How do you get such a proof of ownership? Well, in the system, the uh, authority for whether or not you own a, a particular email address is, of course, the email address provider. So, if you have, I don't know, like a Gmail address, then the authority for that would be gmail.com or mail.google.com. And uh, so the way you get this proof that you own that uh, email address is by simply going to your email provider. So say you log into your webmail, type in your username, your password, you do the whole two-factor off uh, thing, and then you log in. At this point, the browser will generate a public and private key specific to that identity and then it will send the public key over to the email provider. The email provider knows who you are because you're logged in, and so it, at that point it can sign your public key and return it to you. Now when I say you, it's your browser. You don't actually see any of that. It happens transparently. But the signed public key is what we call the certificate. That's a proof that you own the email address and it's signed by the authority for that email address. And so the browser stashes, that somewhere, stashes this certificate somewhere safe. And so what you have is a signed statement from your email provider that you control this email address. Now, it's very similar to how we use passports for inter international travel. Because if you want to travel to another country, first thing you have to do is you have to go to your passport office to get a passport. And then you take your passport home, store it somewhere safe. safe. When, we, when you do go uh, and enter a new country, uh, a, uh, then you present your passport and uh, you let into that, that uh, country. So the, the act of getting a credential and using the credential, those two things are, are separate. So here's what we can do with that uh, certificate that we got proving that we own an email address. This is a demo site that we run, 123done.org. And it's got a button at the top there, sign in with Persona. So I'm going to click on this. And there's a pop-up window that shows on the left all of the email addresses that I have certificates for. So I'm going to pick, pick the second one and then click sign in. So these certificates are in my browser. And there we go. I'm logged in, if you see at the top there, as that email address. So that's all the user has to do to, to use Persona. It's like two or three clicks. And there, and that's it. So simple as that. For the point of view of the website that you're trying to log into, so in this case, we'll log into the LCA website using Persona, then um, what happens is that the user sends what is called an assertion. Now, an assertion is a cryptographic bundle that contains three things. It contains, first of all, the certificate that you got that proves that you control that email address. Um, then it contains a, uh, an audience and an expiry. So the first thing that the site will check is the audience. The audience is the URL of the website that you're trying to log into. Now the reason why you want to have that in the assertion is that if you, if you had sort of a generic assertion that wasn't specific to a particular audience, then the SA website could turn around and then log in as yourself, impersonate you onto another website that uses Persona. But that's not going to work because that other website is going to check the audience and we'll get an audience mismatch. So that's, that's the purpose of that uh, field. Second one is the expiry. By default, assertions are valid for two minutes. So it's just enough time to log you in, but after that, the assertion becomes useless. And finally, we need to check the signature on the certificate. So how do we do that? Well, this is just simple public-private uh, public uh, key cryptography. And uh, in order to check the certificate that was signed by the email provider, we need to go to the email provider, grab the public key, and then we can check the certificate with that. Now, notice that when you grab the public key from the email provider, that's a site-wide key for, or domain-wide key for that provider. Uh, it's not specific to the user that is trying to log into your site. So you're not revealing anything by grabbing the public key. And in fact, you probably, if, it's a, if it's Gmail, you probably already have a cached copy of that public key because it's likely that more than one uh, user on the LCA website has a Gmail address. Once you've verified that, then everything is valid and you can log the user in. 
So Persona replaces the password check, but all the rest of session manage management is the same. You can set your cookie and do whatever you do normally. Now this is a vision of how the system works. There's a big elephant in the room, and um, that is that if we want the system to work exactly like what I've shown, we need the, co the cooperation of all of these people. Right? We need all of the email provider to be on board. We need all of the browser vendors to be on board. Okay, let's take them one at a time. Let's start with email providers. This is what we want to see. If I've got a Gmail address, it will be signed by Gmail. My certificate will be signed by Gmail. Now, Gmail doesn't support Persona natively yet. If you do work on Gmail and you want to talk to me about that, uh, please do after, after the talk. Um, but what we have in the meantime is this. We have a certificate signed by persona.org. So in essence, what we have is we have a fallback identity provider. If the domain that you're using doesn't support persona natively, we fall back to persona.org. The reason why we can sign certificates on behalf of other email domains is simply because the first time you use persona, we send you an email as part of the registration process, and then it's got a unique link, a link with a unique token in it. When you click on that, that proves to us that you control that email address. So it's a pretty normal way of, of checking that. That's what pretty much everybody else does on the internet. Uh, and so that's what we do. Now, of course, we don't want you to have to click on an email link every single time you log into a website. So what we do is we create an account for you uh, on that fallback identity provider. And so you don't have to, to do that every time you want to log in. But what the fallback gives us is that today we support all email providers. So the system is ready to go. We don't have to wait for these people to get on board before we can start using it. Um, but as they get on board, then the system becomes more and more decentralized. Now, the second piece is a little bit trickier. How do we get this inside the browser? Because as I said, we want this to be a browser feature. We don't want something that's tacked on to, to the web. This is what we want. We want a new API directly onto the DOM. So navigator.id, whatever, is what we want to achieve. So we could do maybe an add-on, Firefox add-on, Chrome extension, and get people to try to install that. Um, that's quite easy to do. But uh, if you try to convince a site to use Persona as their only login system, then they may ask um, embarrassing questions like, well, how many users have actually installed the extension? Uh, does that mean that I've only got uh, you know, a 5% chance of, of having a user successfully log into my site? So not a very good uh, solution for this kind of thing. Another thing we could do is we could build it directly into Firefox because uh, we're Mozilla and uh, we have people that work on Firefox. Um, but that's kind of, uh, you know, not, it's, it's better, but it's still like, what, a, a quarter to a third of the browser market? It's not enough. You need a whole lot more if you want to have a credible solution. Well, it turns out Chromium is an open, uh, open source project as well. We could send patches there and eventually they, they would make it to, to the Chrome web browser. Well, that may be true, but we're still missing a couple of browsers. We're still at most two-thirds of the browser market, probably less. So not a very good solution either. What we did in the end is we used this little known language called JavaScript to uh, build a complete implementation of Persona in JavaScript. So it works in all modern browsers on desktop, and it works on all of these uh, mobile browsers as well. Did I say mobile first? Sorry. Desktop on top and mobile at the bottom. Um, so that's what, that's what uh, we get from using JavaScript uh, to do all of this uh, uh, client-side crypto stuff. Now, if you're interested, this pattern of de developing a browser feature and starting with a JavaScript implementation or JavaScript fallback like this is uh, something called LIFT for Locally Isolated Feature Domain. Now, the acronym is not super important, but uh, the idea here is that we want to get trusted code executing in the browser. And the way to do that is there's a couple of tricks to it. First one is we have a domain name. That's the domain name that's hosting the JavaScript implementation of Persona for your browser. So the code runs on there, 
and it uses something called local storage. Now, local storage, for those who don't know, is, very si is a very simple key value store uh, that's built into all modern browsers, and you can easily store and retrieve strings from it. And the particular feature that's interesting to us is that local storage is tied to the domain on which it's, it's executing. So if you have code running on login.presume.org that saves a secret key to local storage, that secret key is only readable from code that's running on that domain. So anybody using Persona on their site can't get to your private key because the private key is only accessible to that domain. So that's, that's why we, we use local storage. Now, of course, we do need um, other people, other sites, to interact through a, a restricted API with the, the crypto stuff that's stored there. So we use for that uh, post message. Post me message is a standard mechanism that web browsers have to uh, do cross-domain message passing. And so we have an API that's built using this. Now, the picture looks like this. So we, you, we have the site uh, that's trying to use Persona for logins, LCA in this case. We have a post message channel, and then we, which talks to Persona, which is the only thing it has access to the local storage stuff. Now, just before I give you a little demo of it, do you, are there any questions, sort of burning questions, that prevent you from understanding what I've explained so far? Is a couple? OK. Uh, just yell on that, and I'll repeat them. Hi, um, I happen to work for an email provider and I'm a little bit interested about this thing where you provide something that claims to verify one of our addresses without us being able to revoke it when, for instance, a user gets hacked or gets dis disabled in some way. Okay, can you ask the question at the end? I, I do, right now I just want like, to, okay. to, to make sure that, uh, it's a very good question and I'll, I'll get to it, but right now I just want to make sure that, that everybody understands the system and uh, so, okay, keep going. Uh, you haven't discussed whether public computers and other public access points, how is this supposed to work with that? Okay, I'll get to that. Yep. <coughs> you got a question? Just a post message. So is that going out from the, from the, the site you're trying to log into out the internet to log in server? So the question was, is, is the post message channel between the site that you're trying to log into and persona, yes, it's going, it's going between the uh, over HTTPS. Yeah, can you yell out your question? Can you have more than one persona for each mail account? Question is, can you have more than one persona for each mail account? Uh, yes, you can have multiple ones. Okay, so I'll just uh, give you a quick demo. Okay, so this is a user that has never logged into Persona before. And this is another uh, demo site that we run, my favorite beer. So you click on Persona, and then you type in your email address. There you go. We ask to create a new password. Excuse me. Why is there a password available? Uh, because it's not so that is because we're sending you an email, and we don't want to send you an email every single time. Uh, so the question was, why is there a password? We don't want to ask you uh, to confirm your email every time you log into a website, so you get an account on the fallback identity provider. If I were using a, uh, a, a email domain that, has native, that had native support for Persona, there would be, uh, it, would, it would just be the password that you have with that, identity, with that um, uh, uh, other organization, not with us. So, okay, so the email has been sent. There it is. We'll click here to confirm it. And there we go. So it's confirmed. And now if I go back to this original site, there you go, I'm logged in. And uh, well, it seems to be a little bit of a bug. There we go. <laughs> so uh, as you can see, I uh, really love Australian craft beers. <laughs> okay, now, what about if you want to use it on your site? Like, how, how does it work? How easy is it to, uh, to implement? Well, go back to the example that I used earlier with 123 done. The first thing that you'll notice if you, if you look into it is that this site has an extra script tag at the bottom of their page. 
And that says, uh, just log, load login.persona.org slash include.js. This is what sets up the, the JavaScript shim that I talked about, the JavaScript implementation of uh, Persona. Second thing that's in there is there's a setup function called navigator.id.watch. And that has three uh, parameters. The first one is logged in user. And that's uh, simply the email address of the user that's currently logged in. So in this case, that would be my email address. But because nobody's logged in to, uh, to because we haven't logged into 123.org uh, yet, uh, we'll just pass in null. The next thing is um, a function that will get called when the user logs into your site. So it's called on login. And I'll get back to the contents of that. The last part is what happens when the user logs out from your website. Um, in this case, all I'm going to do in my application is redirect the browser to a logout page. And the logout page already clears the cookie, destroys the session server side, that kind of stuff. But this is what happens when we need to log the user out. So OK, I'm going to click uh, Sign In. And then the front end will run this function. So navigator.id.request. No parameter is needed. That's uh, all you need to uh, trigger the pop-up window that, happened, that, that looks like this. Now I'm going to pick the same email that, that I used earlier and click Sign In. And that's when the login callback is invoked. So at this point, what you have is you have a function that has one parameter called the assertion, which is, of course, the assertion that I talked about earlier. So when you get the assertion, what you have to do is you have to verify that it's valid, right? as, I, as I said earlier. But you can't do that on the client, because of course the client is under the control of the user. And the user could just fake and, and tell you, yeah, everything is valid, the assertion is valid. So you have to verify the assertion yourself, which means you have to send it to your backend to be verified. So this is just simple jQuery to send the assertion to the backend and then redirect to the home page when uh, everything is done. So let's take a look at what's behind this. Well, let's take a look at the backend. This is what the backend does. Now, this is just Python, but um, could be uh, you know, C++ if you wanted. Um, it really doesn't matter. It's pretty simple. All you have to do is, um, if you want, you can use our online verification service at verify.login.persona.org slash verify. Now, what you pass in to that verifier is the assertion, of course, and the audience that you expect, so the URL of your site. And what you get in return is this. You get a blob of JSON that has two important um, things in it. You have status, which should be OK if the assertion is valid. And then you have the email address of the user that's trying to log into your site. If you have an invalid assertion, for whatever reason, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see status failed, and then you're going to see a reason why it failed. Now, the important thing to note here is that you don't get the email address when you have an invalid assertion. This is there to prevent people from accidentally logging in people when uh, they have an invalid assertion. So you can't do that because you don't even know who's trying to log in uh, if the assertion is not valid. So if you do have a, a valid assertion, then um, that's really all you need to, uh, to set a delicious cookie in a user's browser and carry on with the rest of, of the uh, session management. So OK, we're logged in. We're almost done. What happens when the user clicks the logout button? Well, that's when you have to call navigator.id.logout. Again, no parameter. That's all you need to do. And that will trigger the logout callback that we saw earlier. And then your site will do whatever is necessary to log the user out. And that's it. We're logged out. So just to recap, first thing you have to do is to load this external piece of JavaScript. Then you set up your login and logout callbacks. You do whatever you need to do with your backend to um, log, in, log the user in or out of your site. You add your buttons, and you hook them up to the right functions, either request or logout. And then finally, you have to actually verify the assertion that you get server side. So it's as simple as that. Now, this is a full um, implementation of uh, Persona. So that's, that's a website that, that uses Persona, asks people to log in, verifies the assertion, and then uh, says, hi, email address. Um, that's all there is. It's a PHP code. Uh, doesn't use any external libraries except for curl.
So it's really quite simple to, to, uh, to do uh, on, on your sites. So if you want to help us solve the, pa the password problem once and for all, um, here are a few things that you can do. You can try Persona, add it to your site, to your open source project. Um, that, that would be much appreciated. Um, and then you can tell us about your experience because uh, we're really keen to, hear, to get feedback about what's missing, what's, what's easy, what's hard. Uh, basically, our early adopters set our priorities, quite frankly. And please, email one site that you use every day and ask for persona support in it because large sites are not going to, to, to implement persona support until enough of their users are actually asking for it. So you can do that. And uh, if you don't do any of this, then please grab some stickers, at the very least. So, available here. Um, and uh, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, then I'll get back to the two questions as well. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions was, um, had to do with uh, shared computers. What we do with shared computers is that <laughs> the first time that you use Persona, we assume that you are on a shared computer. And so the, uh, the certificates and, and all that stuff are only valid for five minutes. So if you go away and, and, and someone else uses a computer, as long as you know, they, they, only, they have a five minute window to do anything uh, with that computer. Of course, if you clear the cookies before you leave, um, then everything is gone. Um, so that's one thing. Then uh, the second time, that would be really annoying though for users to have to enter their password every five minutes. So uh, what we do is the second time you use Persona, we, actually, we ask you whether it's a shared computer or not. And then we, we adjust the, the timeout um, accordingly. Now, um, there was also a question about um, how, how can we sign um, how, how can we sign other, other domains, email addresses? Uh, and so you, you, you said that you were hypothetically an email provider. So, so and you're basically verifying um, an identity that's on, on some email providers. Um, so it's just a sign of an identity And you're doing it with some kind of expiry or replication policy that is nothing to do with what the expiry or replication policy that that email provider might have. Yep, so, so the, the issue here was, um, the, the issue that he raised was that um, what if uh, that, user, that user loses access to that email address or something like that, um, the, the, the expiry uh, on, in our systems is not going to match the expiry in, in that system. Um, that's, that's, um, that's an existing problem on the web because, you know, if you, because ev almost every site out there allows for email resets. So it's not, it's not a new problem. Um, we're, we're thinking about it. We're, if you have ideas on, on how exactly that should work, um, so we're, we're thinking about how, how to make this better. Um, but uh, one thing that, we are, that you could do, it, of course, is, is implement um, support for persona in, in your uh, email provider and then you get rid of all these problems and you can select you can choose exactly how long certificates are valid for for your domain and those those sorts of things um, another thing that we'll be rolling out uh, fairly soon is we have we have this idea of a proxy idp which will initially be for gmail yahoo and hotmail only but we might extend it in the future and what we're going to do is if you have say a google account and so you type in a gmail address we're going to we're going to show you the google log into your Google account uh, login page and instead of, uh, of, of sending you an email. And so if you already lo log into your, to your Chrome browser, for example, then uh, there won't be any extra password and, and things like that. And if you stop um, having control of that Google account, then you won't be able to use it anyway. So, yeah. All right, start with you. Does the persona or the assertion tell the third party where to go and fetch the public key in order to verify the assertion? Uh, no, the, the way that that works is that uh, if, you, if you are a third party email provider and uh, you want to, to, to have native support for Persona, um, you're going to expose a file like this. Now this is a domain that, you, that does use uh, Persona natively and it's got a browser ID uh, it's exposing a browser ID file, that, which is a JSON file that contains these things. Um, contains a public key, so that's where the public key is, and then two other uh, sort of endpoints um, make the system work. So, so yep. that 
address will be determined from the email address? No, the address is fixed. So the address is always uh, your domain and then slash dot well known slash browser ID. Um, some people have asked for, uh, for DNS, a, a way to do this in DNS as well. And so we're thinking about adding that as well. But, uh, Questions. Um, one, what happens if you've got a computer that's got its time not synced and it's completely screwed as sometimes happens? And the second question is, can it work with some form of uh, two-factor authentication? Okay, I'm going to start with the second question first because um, I'm going to ask you to repeat the first one afterwards. Um, but the, uh, can we have two-factor auth? Uh, yes, uh, if you uh, if you have um, if if you run the identity provider the, the, the email server, uh, if you if you want to run uh, the, if you want to run an identity provider for persona, then you are free to do whatever you want for authentication. So it could be YubiKeys, it could be you know usernames and passwords, it could be anything you want. Now the first question was it about what happens if your computer uh, crashes or something like that, or uh, if, if you've got a PC that isn't sinking time, and you've only got that two minute window, um, how do you, is there some way of saying, I need a bigger window or something like that? Um, so that, that, um, that time is, is uh, set by the, uh, by the Persona server. And if you use the, the R verifier, it's, it's basically the same machine. So it's not set by, by your browser. It's, it's set by the identity provider and verified by the verifier. So as long as the identity provider is, is not too far off. So yes, they should be like quite somewhat reasonable. Uh, but at the same time, um, that's something that we can adjust if we see that that's actually a problem. We haven't seen any problems with it so far. But we might, in the future, we might bump that to five, 10 minutes or whatever. Um, now, I don't know what the mic is. but. Uh, how is this any different to OpenID? I mean, under OpenID, you're handing over. I mean, you said there was privacy problems with it, mm -hmm. where you're effectively handing over your the list of sites that you visited to Google, for example, who was an OpenID provider. Under Mozilla's Persona, you'd be doing exactly the same thing. Um, the the backend website would be requesting either Persona.org or Google if they implemented the backend there. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good point. Um, what, what I've shown you is, uh, is, is not a fully, you know, it's, it, it, it has centralized components, right? That's, that's basically what you're saying. Uh, it's, it's the same as OpenID. The, the big difference with OpenID is that there's no way to fix it in OpenID. That's the way the protocol works. In Persona, it's fully decentralized. The, fall, the fallbacks that we have that are centralized currently will go away as soon as, it's, as, as, as people join into the thing, right? Like the, the, uh, the, the, the JavaScript file that you get to get the JavaScript implementation of Persona will be unnecessary once you have browser support. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the account that you have on persona.org for the fallback identity provider, that will go away when your email provider has uh, support for it. Uh, the, and then the verifier is entirely optional. If you want to verify assertions yourself, and fetch the keys yourself, you can do that today. There's even a Python library that allows you to do that. So can, you, can you repeat that? Uh, no, you're not, because uh, you're getting the certificate in your browser ahead of time, and then you're visiting another site. So the, 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 it's kind of like a passport thing. You're getting the passport, and you're not telling the passport office which countries you're going to visit later using that, um, that credential. That's the main difference. Yep, there's a mic. Oh, yeah, nice work. Um, this has been tried before with Athena and Shivalath, and the thing that really killed both of those was the lack of non-web authentication, because it couldn't be extended from the web into the other protocols that people use. Um, is it possible to fake up the wireline protocol from non-web sources? Um, so we are, we are working on, on sort of like native implementations of Persona, so outside the web, because uh, another place where that's really useful is, uh, is, is for on mobile. So people that have native apps might want to do things like that without using a web browser. Um, so yeah, it's certainly something that we're exploring. Uh, currently, we're, it, it only works on the web, but uh, actually will. Yep. Is there room for a Persona to OpenID bridge? 
So is there room for uh, an open ID bridge? Um, in theory, we could do it. Like we're going to use OAuth to, to talk to uh, Google, Gmail, and Yahoo uh, through this like, proxy idea. Um, so we, we might decide to do that. We're, we're doing Gmail, Yahoo, and Hotmail first because for most sites, it's about like 80% of their users. Um, but, uh, but we're not sure that we're going to do a generic open ID thing because then we run into the same kind of um, usability problems that open ID has. So. Yeah, there was a question around here, I think. Yep, can you yell it out? I'm um, just wondering about how fixed the current um, encryption schemes are. And if you're doing encryption on mobile in JS and browser, like are you using elliptic curve to display the root or how plugable is it to plug in the ground? So the question is uh, how, how, how fixed is the crypto? Um, that you're using, um, how easy is it to do on various platforms and things like that. Um, the, the short answer to that is that it's, it's in JavaScript and it works in Internet Explorer 8, so uh, it's not that demanding. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like the, the, the crypto stuff, we have libraries that, that, were, that, that some people have written and we have our own. Um, so right now, you know, if you want to do Persona in, uh, in Haskell, um, you will probably have to write the crypto library yourself for, for that bit. But it uses RSA, um, AES, and stuff like that. But um, the, um, the, the sort of uh, certificate format is, uh, is a new web standard called uh, J J JWT. So you, might, you may not have uh, a Haskell plugin for, for that yet. What, <coughs> what's the rationale for tying identity so closely to an email address as a requirement? and then having to go through emails as identity providers rather than tying it to the browser by just generating a private key and using that to authenticate and having email as optional metadata. Yep, so um, the reason why we went for email is that that's based on user research. So we decided to do, to, we decided that, 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 that we had to build a system that users would, under, that would understand. And the one thing that user identifies themselves with uh, very easily is an email address. Now the other thing with the email address that's really quite interesting is that a lot of non-technical people, a lot of non-technical people know how to create a second email address, you know, that, that's kind of anonymous-ish. And they, they can have multiple sort of personalities that, that use different email addresses. Uh, they can have an anonymous one. You know, if you want to use Mailinator, you can use Mailinator if you want. Um, so, so email addresses give us that sort of flexibility. And the other thing is, if, you're, um, if, if, if you uh, want to use different devices, then it's really easy to have something that's portable and not tied to a specific browser. So you're going through and showing how relatively simple it is on the back end for someone wanting to make a site with um, Persona. Mm -hmm. But all the examples had this, you know, hard link, uh, just go to um, login Persona org. Um, as more uh, email providers, you know, allow this kind of thing, do you still have to go there? Or does it, you add in, oh, also check Google, also check Yahoo, also check wherever? Or does it get more complicated? How does that work? Well, the code I've shown you, that's, that's what you have to do if you, if you want to add personal support to your website. When other people jump on board and, and there's, there's native support in the browser and stuff like that, everything stays the same for you. So that's, that's what you have to do, and that, that API is stable. Um, it's not going to change. So you, you do always send things to login persona or to verify things still? So the question is, um, even with native support, you would still be sending information to uh, persona.org. You would not be sending information because uh, the pop-up window that you, would, that you see in the native implementation is, is not actually a pop-up window. It's part of the it's a dialog box in the browser. And uh, so you're not sending a password there or anything like that. Um, Do you have a usability problem if, say, somebody signs up for Persona with a Gmail address, say, and um, Gmail doesn't support Persona natively, so it goes through the fallback stuff on Persona.org, then later Gmail starts supporting Persona natively, won't all the logins then stop working because now they're now G Gmail, who doesn't know about this, is not asserting that they have a an account, and and the browser therefore isn't going on to Persona.org because Gmail is providing an answer. So the in during the transition from um, no support to native support. Um, 
then uh, the, the login page that people will see will be different because uh, it will be kind of like an, uh, it will be a, a Google uh, signing page where you'd be asked to fill in your Google account and uh, well, the, the email will be pre-filled, pre but you'll, be, you'll see the Google um, page that will ask for uh, your Google password. In fact, most users will not even see anything because they're already logged into their Gmail. And so it will just go through and, uh, and, and the verification will happen automatically. Oh. Yep, can you hit yellow that? Yeah, um, so I really like the design, but it seems really unfortunate that you need to make a new persona.org password to do this. Mm -hmm. That seems to create the same problem as with OpenID. Um, is that going to go away at some point, or uh, like why not just send somebody an email the first time they log in from a new device there? Well, and, and on that, it, um, you're encouraging the user to type in username at gmail.com and then a password that isn't a gmail.com password. Okay, so the, the, the comments were um, when you're using a fallback identity provider, you're asking users to pick a password, right? And uh, can, so, uh, so yes, that's right. Um, and uh, the, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll talk about that as well. Um, the, so, yeah, ideally, you know, we wouldn't have to because there'd be native support. Um, but the reality is that, like, we, we do have to, to ask for something uh, because otherwise, if we were to send an email every time that you, you know, it, it would otherwise it would mean that every time you clear your cookies or you use a different browser or, uh, you know, you, you do something with your phone and you have to reinstall it or whatever, you'd have to, like, uh, do another email verification thing. So, um, so we do, uh, we decide to do the, the, the password stuff because that's, that's kind of the easy thing. Now, the follow up to that was um, if, if if you're asking users to type in their um, email address and then the, their password after that, um, maybe they'll, they'll put in their actual Gmail password. Um, that's quite possible. In fact, um, you know, for, the, for a very large percentage of the population, uh, their Gmail password is their only password on the internet anyways. Um, so you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate as many of these password prompts as possible and bring it down to one, which is the identity provider, the email provider. You know, that one's not going to go away unless you know, you're switching to YubiKeys or something like that. But you need to identify yourself at some point using either something you know, something which is like a password, something you are, like a fingerprint or something, or something you have, like some kind of token, YubiKey or whatnot. Um, so that requirement will remain. But if we can eliminate all of these prompts except for one, um, that would be as good as it can get, I think. Unfortunately, that's afternoon tea. So on behalf of the conference and Linux Australia, thank you very much for your speech.